The presenter is ready, the debaters are ready, and the audience is ready. And we trust you are ready to stay with us for the next 90 minutes for this special debate on Thursday, the 9th of September. Well, next week, the uh, Pope Benedict XVI will arrive in Britain for a state visit. He comes both as head of state and leader of a major denomination. It's almost 30 years uh, since the last pontiff was here, and it's only the second pope to come since the Reformation. In the light of this, tonight we have put a motion before this house that says, we believe the Pope's visit to Britain will be good for the country. And we've got two speakers, obviously. Uh, we've got a lot more speakers around there, but we've got two living speakers here. Speaking for the motion, former atheist Peter Williams. Welcome, Peter. Thank, Thank you, you very much yeah. for coming. Uh, Peter's now a pro-life campaigner. A uh, graduate theology student at King's College London and a whole list of other things which I've cut out. But also a speaker for Catholic Voices, which is a, a, a Catholic apologetics team set up specifically for the Pope's visits. Yes. And we hope to do more uh, work beyond them, but yeah. But that's where you started that's life. Starting, yeah. Great. And speaking against the motion, Duncan, Duncan Boyd. Welcome, Duncan. Thank, Thank you. you very much for coming. Uh, Duncan was uh, educated at Stowe Christ Church, uh, Oxford, uh, called to the bar in 1994. Hmm. Um, and you've worked in politics as a researcher for Michael Portillo. Yeah, I did. I wrote a lot of letters for him, yes. <laughs> many, many letters. One or two uh, uh, and, press releases, and, but a lot uh, of letters. And you were also in the General Synod of the Church of England, and you worship at All Souls Langham Place. That's right. Great. Thank you very much uh, for coming, and we're looking forward uh, to hearing what both of you have got to say. And we're also looking forward to hearing what you've got to say in the audience. I mean, I, normally these debates are quite lively. We get all sorts of oohs and ahs from the, uh, the audience, maybe a few hisses and boos as well at, at, at the same time. But please be ready uh, to take part. We'll have opportunity for comment, and some of you have also uh, will be asking questions uh, as we go along. And the viewers at home, you won't be left out because you can text in, you can email in on the normal numbers that will come up on your screen from time to time. They will be uh, uh, printed out, brought into the studio, and Rochelle uh, will be reading many of them out as we go through uh, the evening. So sit back, take part, enjoy as we go along. Just one thing to let you know, after 58 minutes tonight, we'll be saying goodbye to those who are watching some of the repeats, because some of the repeats will only be an hour long. So if you're watching the repeat, and we say goodbye at 58 minutes, and you're desperate to know what went on afterwards, you'll just have to buy the DVD, or you can watch when it's an hour and a half programme. Before we start in the studio, though, we send our cameras out into uh, the high streets of New Malden, Wimbledon, Twickenham, a few other places, just to see what the public were thinking concerning this visit. I'm a Catholic, so I should be going to see him. I think it's a great, a great thing. I haven't seen, seen a Pope in this country for years, so, yeah, it's a great thing. It was a good thing Pope's coming to England. That should be a blessing to England as well. I think it's a good thing for the Christian in the UK. Uh, they will feel, you know, Pope is like, uh, for us, it's like, not God, but it's a preacher for us. I don't, I don't think he should be coming here at all, really. Uh, I, I think it's a waste of taxpayers' money. As you said, £10,000 could be spent something else. 
£10 million pounds could be spent on something else? I think it is, because they, they, need more, uh, they, they need more godly things on this. What they do, they, they put God out of their life and a lot of things has gone wrong. A lot. And then they're against people who are religious and who do believe in God and wants to practice their faith. And, uh, you know, I think they do need God very much in their life. Without the Pope, we mean, mean, we mean nothing. That's the way I look at it. And uh, my boy, he was only four year old, and the other one was only eight year old, and the girl was only uh, seven. And we all went and camped out all night, waiting for the Pope to come. I think it should be a state visit, really, because I think a lot of people would love to see the Pope, and they really don't have the chance. So I think it'd be very interesting and very good. And I'd like to see the church get more involved with other churches as well, with the Catholic religion and other churches get being involved as well. I think it's excellent. Um, there is a lot of, there is a huge Catholic community here. To us, he represents Peter, and he's been elected. We are happy to receive him. I mean, I'm not Catholic, but I do agree with him coming. I think it'd be lovely for us. We could do with a little bit of religion, couldn't we? <laughs> well, we could do with a little bit of religion. Well, that's very, very interesting. We, those people were just uh, at random in the street. Interestingly, we only found one person that would actually say no as far as that was concerned. Now, let's see what happens tonight uh, from this point of view. What happens, obviously we know which side uh, our, our debaters are on here. We, we will find out what is happening in the studio audience a little bit later. I want Peter to, to start with you and give you just five minutes uh, to really lay, as it were, an overview of your position, where you're coming from and speaking for the motion. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you very much uh, for coming. It's great to be with you, and thank you very much, Doug, for organising this debate, and Duncan for being here. It'll be very interesting to have the dialogue. Um, on the 16th to the 19th, Pope Benedict uh, the 16th, um, who is leader of the Catholic Church, is coming to Britain. Uh, he's been invited by the government, by the state. He was invited by Prime Minister Gordon Brown. He's been re you know, that invitation has been kept long by Prime Minister David Cameron. And he's going to be coming to talk to and meet British society as a whole. Not just Catholics, but the whole of British society. He'll be meeting the Queen, he'll be meeting the Prime Minister, he'll be re meeting the uh, leaders of the opposition. Um, <clears throat> he'll be meeting uh, civic leaders, he'll be also meeting religious leaders like uh, Rowan Williams, the primate of the Anglican Communion, at least in, uh, in England. And because of this, we're, off we're giving to him as a nation our hospitality. And hospitality, I think, is a very basic uh, Christian moral tenet. And it's entirely appropriate that we do so, because he's not just coming to give a party to Catholics. He's coming to talk to us about the issues that matter to our society. And I'm very glad that he's doing so. We as Christians should particularly be glad that he's coming, because there are so many issues that our society really needs to talk about. Particularly, I'm thinking of things like religious freedom and the debate between equality, certain rights, and religious freedom. Also talking about social justice, the right to life. The Catholic Church, as with all Christians, preaches a gospel of life that we want to present to society. But beyond that, I think it'll also be a wonderful opportunity for us all as Christians to enter into dialogue on the things that we differ about. I know that we'll be doing that this evening with Duncan. Um, they are, the differences that are there before us are important differences. They are not um, adiaphoristic, which is to say they're not unimportant or trivial. But at the same time, there's a lot that we have greatly in common, that we can unite upon as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think exploring that, engaging in that dialogue, will be a wonderful opportunity. So I commend the motion to the House. I commend the idea that the Pope's visit will, become, will be a very positive thing for this country. And um, I hope you will agree with me. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> a few do. We shall see. <laughs> Duncan, maybe you would like to put your basic argument against the motion. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I echo um, uh, Peter's uh, uh, words. Thank you for inviting me and um, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, my basic position I, I, is I believe in the Bible. Everything uh, 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 that I want to say is governed by the simple principle that I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. I think it's God speaking to us. And so when we consider something like the papacy and the pope, the claims that the pope makes about himself, not simply as a spiritual leader, 
uh, but also as a political leader, which he is, that is something that we should judge in the light of scripture. So uh, I'm going to just, I'm opposing the motion. I don't think that the papal visit to this country is a good thing, but I want to flip it on its head, as it were, and say, <clears throat> what is it that I think would be good for Britain as a country? What would be a positive good thing uh, for our country that we as Christians can support, something that we should pray for and something which we think would benefit our country? The best thing that could happen to our country is first for our churches to return to a belief in the Bible, to preach it, to teach it. Um, thank you. And, and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is desperate, the state of our society at the moment, and it's desperate. I'm a member of the Church of England, but it saddens me profoundly that there are senior clerics of the Church of England who deny fundamental elements of the Christian faith and who also now controversially are challenging uh, clear biblical teaching in the area of sexual ethics. So a positive thing for our nation would be for the church to believe the Bible, to preach the gospel, and to teach it unequivocally. It would also be a good thing for our country if our legislators, if our um, politicians were to shape our laws and which to, uh, were to pass laws which are in obedience to the Bible. So that would be also a blessing to our nation. Why then am I opposed? Why do I think that it's not a good thing that the Pope uh, should visit our country? The first reason why I don't think it's a good thing is that I believe that Roman Catholicism is a false religion. I know that people find that's a hard thing to say, but if you judge the Church of Rome both historically and also judge her on the basis of her foundation, her doctrinal foundation, the heart of the Christian gospel is that God makes a promise to men and women that if they turn to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, he will forgive them. And the justification or forgiveness comes through faith. If you look at the uh, foundational documents of the Church of Rome, that is the canons and the decrees of the Council of Trent, <clears throat> which were written in the 16th century and were a response to the Protestant Reformation, to the teaching of Calvin and Luther, there the doctrine of justification by faith is not simply disagreed with, it is anathematized. The Latin term that is used is anyone who believes this anathema sit. That means let him be anathema, let him be accursed. So at that very simple doctrinal point, the Church of Rome denies the gospel and the Pope is the leader of a vast church which denies the gospel. The second point, and I'll just be brief, uh, is that the Pope makes big political claims. We have, although we don't talk about it a great deal in, in our country, we have a Christian constitution and it's a Protestant Christian constitution where there's a wonderful moment where the moderator of the Church of Scotland hands to the monarch the Bible and says, these are the lively oracles of God. In our constitution, the Bible is at the center of our national life. Now the Pope makes big claims for himself as a political leader, which are utterly at odds with our own Protestant constitution and with the possession, position of our monarch and the Houses of Parliament. So for both of those reasons, I don't think that the papal visit would be a blessing to our country and we'd better spend our money, we would better spend our money on something else. You know, there was an archbishop in America, um, Fulton J. Sheen, who once said, people don't so much oppose the Catholic Church as what they think the Catholic Church is. And I think we saw just there from Duncan that people think they know what the Catholic Church is and they don't really know her at all. I mean, things like the idea of anathema sit. Yes, the Council of Trent, which is one of the ecumenical councils of the Catholic Church, not a foundational council, actually. If you want to go back to the foundations of the Catholic Church, you have to go back way back into the um, hundreds, two hundreds, three hundreds, like the Council of Nicaea, which uh, established the basic tenets of the Christian faith, not established them anew, but rather affirmed them against the heretics of the time. But anathema sit, you should, that, in order to, if someone believes this and they are anathema, does not mean they're accursed in general. It means that they are excommunicated. In other words, they are no longer members of the Catholic Church. It is definitional of being Catholic that you don't believe in justification by faith alone. So what does that mean then? Anathema sit must mean you go to hell. It's a mortal if sin. You are, if, you're if you're excommunicated, you're it's excommunicated, a mortal sin. Yeah. It doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to anyone else here because they've never been members of the Catholic Church. It applied to the people of the time who are members of the Catholic Church and who were then excommunicated, yes. And if they died in a state of mortal sin, if they died in a state whereby they knowing the truth, 
yet rejected it, then yes, certainly, well, that has grave consequences. But that is not the same as saying to every single member of this audience who is an evangelical Protestant, or anyone here who has never received the fullness of the gospel and, yet never, and never rejected it for that reason, that therefore they are in hell or they're going to hell. So I think that you need to fundamentally understand what was going on at the time and the differences between then and now. The political claims of the Catholic Church aren't particularly problematic either. The Church's claims politically are to say the Church, the Roman Catholic Church if you like, the Catholic Church, is the Church founded by Jesus Christ and as such preaches the fullness of the Gospel in all the claims of the Gospel. And therefore because of that we can judge all the different claims of politics <clears throat> according to the light of the Gospel. We certainly can. The Gospel is not merely a claim for your personal spiritual life. It makes claims beyond that into the fullness of society. God, Jesus Christ, is Lord not just of our, so our souls but of our society and our whole world. And for that reason what mm. set the Catholic Church to believes being the fullness of the Gospel of Jesus Christ is in fact something we can apply to all society. That's the political claims of, of the um, Catholic Church and for that reason I don't think they're problematic. Uh, well, well the, 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 it's not correct. I mean, the anathema sit applies to someone who uh, simply says that someone who is unjust is uh, justified by faith alone. So if no, you find it, it's, it simply doesn't apply simply to excommunicates. For someone like me, I understand fully what the teaching of the Church of Rome is, yes. uh, that it's justification through the sacraments as regeneration by baptism, mm -hmm. and I reject it. So... Um, the argument you've given is an interesting one, but anyone who understands what the Church of Rome says and says, I don't believe it, I believe what the Bible says, falls under the anathema of Trent. That's the plain meaning of the term. No, well, we'll have to disagree on that. We'll I mean, I read, I read all of the canons of the Councils of Trent in Good. the original Latin a couple of weeks ago, and uh, uh, the, the language could scarcely be more plain. Mm -hmm. But on the second point, on the political uh, claims, I mean, I, I'm a, I will agree with Peter this far, it is certainly true that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So he has authority over everyone on our planet. Many, sadly, of the people in our planet are in rebellion against him, and that's a tragic thing. And if they don't repent on the Day of Judgment, uh, they will face his wrath. At the moment, he offers his forgiveness, but on the Day of Judgment, there will be a Day of Wrath. So it's a sad thing that that's the case, and I'm agreeing with Peter that Jesus does have that authority. But the Pope does not. And if you go back, if you look at, there, it's a slightly longer point, but Vatican I, you're probably aware, says that the Pope claimed when he speaks ex cathedra, infallibility. That when he's speaking in his capacity uh, as Pope on a matter of faith or morals, that he's infallible. And that applies retrospectively as well as prospectively. So if you go back to the statements of the papacy mm -hmm. that are made in that capacity, they're infallible and forward. There is a very important bull called Unam Sanctam, which was passed in 1302 by Boniface VIII, mm -hmm. where he lays claim, he lays uh, claim to authority over all kings and over all political institutions. And that is something that only Jesus Christ can claim, and the Pope certainly cannot. Okay. Well, uh, let's move on. We'll come back to some of these doctrinal sure. issues. I, I think you both made your points on that, and, and we will leave them there. I, I mean, we're aware there's not going to be agreement tonight. And I, what I want you to do is to both have the opportunity to make your clear statements so that folks watching, folks here, can, can look at that for themselves. Um, I'd like, there, were, there are two main objections that it seems to me, as I've been looking at this, to this visit. Um, <coughs> objection is, number one is on the doctrinal side. And I want to come back to that in just a minute. Mm -hmm. But the cost side, mm -hmm. this is a state visit. Mm -hmm. And as a state visit, it's not a private visit, but as a state visit, it means that the British taxpayers have to pick up quite a big bill. And it's estimated that British taxpayers will end up with a bill of something like £10 million pounds or more. Um, I suppose my question, I come to you first on this, Peter, is in today's world and in the society that we're living in, is such extravagance actually justified? And secondly, is it fair that non-Catholics should pay for it? OK, they're great. Um, I think that the basic question is, should we have state visits? Because this kind of extravagance is associated with state visits. Um, I think that in this case it's totally justified, both on the cost issue and the idea of uh, non-Catholics paying. For one thing, the parts of the faithful visit that deal only with Catholics, so 
liturgies, things like that. Uh, there'll be a liturgy in Cofton Park in Birmingham, there'll be a liturgy in Hyde Park in London, there'll be a liturgy up in uh, Scotland. Those will be paid for by the Catholic Church, not by anyone else. They are not going to be paid for by the state. There's been a strict delineation between what the government will pay for and what the church will pay for. Now, what the, church, the state will be paying for will be the occasions and the security around the occasions when the Pope is coming to address the state. Now, I think this is basically rather uh, a no-brainer because if someone comes to your house, um, then you, of course, show them hospitality. And you do give them food, and <laughs> you do give them towns. shelter. <laughs> to tell me, it, because it's a state visit, yeah. 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 But thankfully, we, know, we don't have, uh, certainly to my house, no one comes who's that important that we need that kind of security. Uh, no one, but in this case, yes, this is what happens. If you get the President of South Africa, the same thing would happen. The President of China, the same thing would happen. The President of the United States, the same thing would happen. So this is totally understandable. That's why non-Catholics, it is just that they pay for that, because we're all British citizens. And, it does, and if I'm a, a non-South African, and I'm paying for the President of South Africa to come here, well, yeah, uh, this is my country, and I'm showing hospitality, the state is, on my behalf, showing hospitality to someone who's coming to our country, so therefore we should pay for it. But the second thing I think about the cost is, I think, been, been totally dealt with by the simple fact that actually the papal visit will generate more money than it will cost. The Edinburgh Evening News and, in fact, the Glasgow City Marketing Bureau both uh, have talked about studies which have shown that actually when he comes, when the Pope comes to Scotland, he will generate between Edinburgh and Glasgow 12.5 million pounds. Why? Because people are coming to Edinburgh and Glasgow, they're coming overnight to visit, they're spending money while they're there, it's going to be marketing, it's going to be advertising, all of that sort of thing is generating money for the local economy. And that more than pays for the whole visit already, 10 million versus 12.5 million. But, but the same could, thing will happen to Birmingham. just come back, it doesn't because that, I, I mean, the hotels will get that, the shops will get yeah. that, um, but I won't get that, and therefore I still have to pay my well, part you know, for it. That's a very selfish attitude, <laughs> mate. I have absolutely. To say. That's a very selfish uh, absolutely. But if we're talking about does this benefit the country, which is what we're referring to, <laughs> then I think benefiting the local economy is certainly worth it. And in fact, it, again, we can go to Birmingham as well. I've got actually the figures here. The Birmingham Post has recently said the paper visit will bring 12.5 million into the city's economy. And again, that's going to cost for Birmingham, the cost for Birmingham specifically, 80,000. <clears> that more than pays for it it generates the economy. So rather than saying this papal visit will cost us, on the contrary, it'll generate lots of money and we'll be very happy to have it. So on the cost issue, this is a simple no-brainer. The papal visit is going to benefit us, not cost us. OK. Um, mm. Sounds to me like one of these Olympic things that, you know, they say we're going to be great afterwards and we never are. But we're, we're, we'll see. <laughs> um, Duncan, what would you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a waste of money. I think I, Peter is right, undoubtedly. If there is a state visit, then we have a duty as taxpayers to pay for that. That certainly is part of national hospitality. The prior question is, should we be having a state visit? One important question is, what is the state over which the Pope is sovereign? It's the size of a golf course. The Pope is... Uh, you, we don't normally give state visits to chairman of, of, golf, chairman of golf clubs. So the, the Pope is not a political leader in the normal sense of that word. He does have a very peculiar status. Should he be? That's my prior question. Should he be a head of state? And I think the answer to that for a sincere Christian is no, he should not. He should not be a head of state. He is a minister of religion. In my judgment, he's the minister of a false religion. But whichever way you look at it, he should not be a head of state. There's only one person who can be both priest and king, and that is Jesus Christ. And the Pope is... Should not hold that role. Well, whether, whether Duncan you like it or not, uh, he is the head of state of a country. And in fact, more, he's not just head of the Vatican City, he's head of the Holy See, which in fact has had relationships with dip uh, diplomatic relations with this country since the 14th century. Obviously, there was then a gap of, of several centuries where he, there weren't any diplomatic relations when per Catholics here were persecuted. But then it came back in 1914, we have diplomatic relations. This is a state, the Holy See, not the Vatican City, which is the quote unquote golf course you're referring to, um, <laughs> which in fact, has, had, has diplomatic relations currently with around 200 countries. It's recognised as a state by those people. So this is, by, by any definition, a state visit. Beyond that, um, the idea that, well, he can't be a, a head of state because he's a religious figure, well, where in international law is that definition? I'm sorry, there are many religious figures who are heads of many states. And yes, the Pope is a very unusual figure. He is both the head of the church and, well, head of the, he's, he's the prime minister, if you like, of the church. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. But the prime ministerial position that he has from Isaiah 22, verses 20 to 22, cough reference with Matthew 16, 18, we can look at that later, is that he is the executive, if you like, head of the Catholic Church and he is the head of state of the Holy See. So 
he is head of state by any definition, but I note that you've pretty much ceded the cost ground, so I guess, I guess we agree on that. No, I'm not. We, we, we don't agree Wait. on it. He simply shouldn't be. I'm making a Christian point that it is not legitimate for someone who professes to be a disciple of Jesus Christ to make those claims. And there are good reasons, historically, why we haven't had a... Uh, 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 why we haven't had state visits from the Pope because of you raised the issue of history and Catholic persecution. If you look at the history of the Catholic Church, it has historically been a persecuting church. The founders of the Church of England were and, burned alive. And the there were and many the people in this country who were burned alive. Well, and, no, they didn't. Yeah. The issue okay. was different. Well, 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 well. I mean, hang <laughs> drawn and quartered. By okay. <laughs> and we, we, we started this question on cost, exactly. and we're now hang drawn and quartered people. I, I'm yeah. not quite sure how we got it. No it, one comes, any, off, any, no one comes well, across nice. Well, anybody in the <laughs> audience got an actual point to make on the cost side at, at, at the moment? And anybody want to come in on, on the cost side? No? Fine, you're all happy. Oh, way. yes, we, sorry, I can't see everybody. Yeah, okay, fine. Thank you, Doug. I uh, just, want, just wanted to sort of pick up your points about economics. I mean, it's, it's pretty much a simple economic um, rule that uh, money that comes into um, a local city is going to be stimulating the economy. Um, everybody is going to be benefiting, not just in Birmingham, not just in London, Glasgow, Edinburgh. It's going to be benefiting the whole country. Um, I mean, Peter's made the point um, that I think uh, in Birmingham it's going to be £80,000 um, investment in favour of a £12.5 million profit. Now, if I could get that rate of profit in any bank, I'd run to it. I mean, so what are we talking about here? The Pope is going to be making a huge profit for this country, and it's absolutely right that we should be welcoming, welcoming him on economic grounds as well as spiritual grounds. Amen. Okay, we're, thank we're you. talking about a Christian, an issue of Christian and political principle. Uh, OK, sorry, if you haven't got the mic, we won't be able to hear you anyway. Sorry, yeah. mm. we'll we try and come back to it in just a bit. Yeah. If it's a business exercise, then maybe the Pope's visit is a good idea if it's just about money. But you see, it, 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 exactly what that lady said is what the country needs is not uh, uh, money and so on. What it needs is God. Amen. And what we have with the Pope is, mm. a, is a false leader of a counterfeit church. And, and when we sat with the Metropolitan Police in organising the protest that we will be having at Westminster Abbey, we asked for St. Stephen's Gate and we were told we couldn't have it. And then we said, why? Because we can have it when the Queen opens Parliament. So when they say that the Pope is, is just like any other leader, he's like Zuma, he's like every other uh, leader, he's not like every other leader because he has exceptional treatment. Motorways in, in Scotland are being closed. They're not closed when Zuma comes. Also, Zuma doesn't make claims and hasn't in the past or the future. And Zuma has not been an enemy of this country for 400 and 500 years. Oh, please, so we on. can go on and on. So when okay. it comes to finance, if you just want to have a business transaction and you want to stimulate some hotels, sure, sure, the Pope's visit's probably worth the money. OK, let's uh, we're, we're, we're move on because I, I think the second area which I think has been underlying a lot of what's been said at the moment, of course, is the doctrinal area. And, and I think just about every answer that we've given so far, no matter where we've started, we've ended up with the whole doctrinal um, uh, uh, area. And the, uh, uh, there was a statement that was made um, that the, uh, the teaching of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church is, quote, <laughs> at total variance with the biblical message that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, if we start with you, Duncan, um, I, I, I almost know the answer to this, but I'll develop it more than yes. Yeah. I mean, do, do, do you agree with this? And, and do you see this as a reason for saying no to the visit, i.e. that doctrinal stance? Uh, yes, the short answer is yes. Um, I, I spoke about it earlier. I mean, the, the biblical gospel is the most precious thing we have as a nation, as a country we do. It's a great heritage that we have a heritage of gospel witness and that message of the gospel is that it is through faith alone we don't need a priest we don't need sacraments if you're on your deathbed and you wish to make your peace with god you can do that by a simple prayer asking god to forgive you for jesus sake we do not need the uh, uh the paraphernalia of the church of rome it is misleading it leads people away from a saving faith in Jesus Christ. So yes, I completely agree. This is, uh, for me, the fundamental issue is not an issue uh, of money or profit. It is, is what the Roman Catholic Church says true? Judged by the teaching of the Bible, is it true? This is an issue of eternal life or eternal death. If they are right, then the gospel is untrue. If the Bible is right, 
then the Church of Rome is untrue, and that is the fundamental issue. I agree with you on one point. This is a matter of truth, and that is the most fundamentally important thing. Um, absolutely. And the fundamentally important thing about this whole issue is that um, what you claim the Bible says is in fact not what the Bible says. What evangelical Protestantism believes is a theological novum. No one believed this before the 16th century. A theological and novum. That is a new thing, something mm. that no one believed before the 16th century. Not mm. one. We're before the 16th century, we, we have four apostolic churches. We have the Catholic Church, then we have the... Uh, okay. Excuse me. Sorry, we, we can't hear we, you without we, microphones, so we give we, you a chance. We have, we have the Catholic Church. We have then the Assyrian Church of the East that breaks away from the Catholic Church. We then have the Oriental Orthodox Church that breaks away. And we have the Eastern Orthodox Church, and there's a schism in around 1054. If you go to any number of those churches, despite the fact that they have broken away from the Catholic Church, they all believe the same thing about the sacraments, about baptism, about the Eucharist, about salvation. And no one believed what Duncan believed at all before the 16th century. Now, if you want to tell me is that, that, is, that, that, that that is genuine Christianity, well, I'm sorry, that stretches credulity to the maximum. But actually, on one thing, I think that we would have to say, as a Catholic, I do believe we are saved by grace alone. And I do believe we are saved by Christ alone. What I deny, and I absolutely deny this to the hilt, is that we are saved by faith alone, and that we know the truth through Scripture alone. I absolutely deny that as utterly unbiblical, utterly irrational, and totally contrary to Christian history. Does that mean that I don't recognize that people who are disagreeing with me on that point are not my brothers and sisters in Christ? No, it doesn't. Because I do recognize the importance of conscience. I realize that not everyone knows the fullness of the truth. Not everyone has had the fullness of that truth preached to them and brought to them. And so do, consequently, I don't think I can judge their consciences by that point. But I think the, 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 the uh, dialogue is worth having. And I have to say, the only time when the term faith alone is even used in the Bible is when it is explicitly condemned by James 2.24. 20, 20, uh, 20, 20, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. If it is true that faith alone is the biblical principle, why is it contradicted by it? Uh, well, I don't think it is. You know, the, 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 uh, one, as a historical point, what Peter said is simply not true. If you go back to the earliest church, there is a consensus about the way of salvation. If one goes to one of the earliest documents in the church, the letter of Romans, Paul says, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So I don't understand how you can say how the that justification. what I believe? This is teaching quite clearly that the way of salvation yeah. is not mediated by sacraments. Well, you no, tell me, what is the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification? The Roman Catholic doctrine of justification is that we are saved by the grace of Christ infused into us, washing us of, clean of our sins and making us unified to him. So, the instrumentality of that, which is to yes. say, how do we get this grace? How do we get this supernatural life of God that washes us clean of our sins? It is faith. It is the sacraments, which is to say the first sacrament is baptism. Mm. 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you, not as a washing of dirt from the body. At those times, they believed that, in fact, uh, the Jews had a, a, a ritual that still do today called the tevilah, which means uh, that you are basically uh, uh, dripped into a bath of water known as a mikvah, and that ritual purity you got from that allows you to enter into the temp temple. What Peter is saying is it's not like that. It's not like a, a, any longer an external <coughs> ritualistic purity. This is you being cleansed of your sins. Baptism now saves you not as a washing of dirt from the body, but as an appeal for a clear conscience. Now, let me ask you, if you believe... Well, I don't think you've answered it, my question, I am asking though. you a question. Hang on. Well, I don't think you've answered finish. the question, though. OK, so mm. it's baptism, and then after that, when you, have, when you are baptized, when you are made a Christian, when you are brought into the body of Christ, you are the, you, if you then sin again, you, ha you can be washed again of your sin through the sacrament of confession. And you do, in fact, have a journey of faith, whereby through faith and through the works of your life, you grow in holiness with God to that perfection that you will have with him in heaven. That's d truncated, but that's basically okay. the justification. Where, where would you see that Scripture disagrees with that, Duncan? I think it's absolutely clear that the letter to Romans says that the instrumental cause of justification is faith. There is absolutely not a shred of evidence within any of the teachings of the earliest documents, the Christian church, the New Testament, for the idea. I mean, I have to say, I think Peter's description, I've done rather a lot of research on Roman Catholic doctrine in the original documents, and this is a spun version of what the Roman Catholic Church says. The doctrine of justification within the Roman Church is that you are justified when you are baptized, yeah. is it not? Yeah. Which you didn't spell out, but that is it. Well, I did, but, actually, yeah. Okay, sorry. Well, I may have misheard you, but 
So we, if, we'll if, roll if the tape back and find out. We later. can roll the tape back and find out. <laughs> the Bible does not teach that we are justified by baptism. The passage in Peter that he was referring to is saying that Jesus does say that there is a requirement to be baptized when you have put your faith in Christ. However, that is not what justifies you. What justifies you, because there is a parallel made in the letter to the Romans between justification and circumcision, mm -hmm. and Paul makes it fundamental to his argument that Abraham believed and was justified before he was circumcised. So yeah. circumcision is a sign of his justified status. Baptism is a sign of someone's justified status. It is not the instrumental cause of justification. So, so the when teaching, you say, when you say, so the teaching, uh, uh, thank you. So, so the teaching of the Church of Rome is is in in error on that point, and that's a very important point. And the simple simple example, which refutes it very clearly, is the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross was justified simply by a simple act of faith before he died, without baptism. That's right. That's right. And it's interesting that the early church always believed that baptism came in three kinds. Water baptism, which was the normative form of baptism. Baptism of desire, which is to say when you desire baptism but you are killed before it happens, that is a baptism of desire that counts as baptism for you. And baptism of blood, when you are martyred. It's interesting that whenever evangelical Protestant apologists like yourself refer to the earliest documents of the Christian church, they always refer to the Bible alone and not at all the early Christian church's other documents, the Didache, uh, St. Clement's Letter to the Corinthians, any of the other Christian documents which completely contradict what you believe. But nonetheless, the point of the matter is you th think that baptism does not save you, whereas the scriptures say baptism now saves you. It is in black and white. If, and, if, if and it's Romans, accompanied by conscience and, and faith. And the whole uh, point no, is that you says, have to understand no, what Peter says what, in the totality of the teaching of the New Testament. I agree. That if and the totality important. of it is baptism yeah. now saves you as an appeal for a clear conscience. Now, if it is an appeal for a clear conscience and you are saved by the faith that you know, this is signifying, then in what way are you appealing for a clear conscience in baptism? You know, either you've already got the clear conscience, which you got by faith, or this baptism, which you are receiving, is going to give you the clear conscience. There is the instrumental cause. Okay. Okay. And it's, the, the thing is, what, you're, what you don't, I think this is important, what we agree on is you are saved by grace alone. We don't believe that you are saved by simply doing a thing. You know, nothing that you do can earn you salvation before a holy God. Nothing. The only way you can be saved is by the grace of God, earned through the merits of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That is what we all believe. What we disagree with here, or we disagree on, is the instrumentality. How do you receive that grace? Is it by faith alone, or is it by the sacraments that Jesus instituted and through the church that he founded? Jesus didn't come to give us a book. I love this book. It is fundamentally important to my life. But he didn't just come to give me this. He came to give me a church, and that church is the means by which we receive the grace of Christ and by which we are saved. OK, I mean, that, that of course, opens up a whole realm that if we're not in that church, we, we're, we're not saved. And so uh, that, 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 that opens question. up a whole other realm, question. which we'll go to or maybe oh, just in a minute. What I'd like to do at this point is, is bring some... Well, I'd like to come to Rochelle first of all, because I've seen we've had uh, quite a few emails already uh, from our uh, viewers. And so I'd like you to read some of those out, if you would, Rochelle. Let's hear what our viewers are thinking of this at this time. Yeah, well, we've had a flood of emails coming in, so I want to thank everyone who's been contacting us. Please continue. We've got one here that says, I think it's diabolical the money we, the taxpayer, have to pay. As regards to the Pope's visit, our priorities are with Jesus the King and not with the Pope. Let the Catholics pay for this visit, not us Christians. And that's from somebody in New York. <laughs> OK. <laughs> There's another one um, from Jason, which says, I think the man has given the Pope his authority. He was elected in the conclave and not called by God like Samuel the prophet. I think he is a good man, though, but let's not get hysterical and worship or bow down to any man other than Jesus. I Amen. believe the church is a personal relationship with God. And that's from Jason. There's another one that says, why should we have a leader that has overseen systematic abuse of children? And that's from someone in Fulton. That's a question we may hopefully get to <laughs> in a little while, yes. There's another one that says, the United Kingdom is a Protestant nat nation which has rejected Roman uh, Catholicism. Uh, the Pope is a complete irrelevant person in the, o um, <laughs> in the only true doctrine. That's from Chris. Okay. Uh, there's another one that says, Good evening, Doug and guests. Firstly, I've heard the Pope's uh, visit is generating money in the UK. I also see a different perspective on the Pope's visit and wonder if this could be a firing pin for biblical prophecy. 
I'm going to keep my eyes and ears wide open, and that's God bless from Noel. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you want me to stop there. Yeah, keep yeah, reading. Just okay. Maybe one more. Okay. Um, there's one that says, I'm a Methodist minister. I would love to be a fly on the wall um, when the Pope, who is against the ordination of women, meets the president of the Methodist Conference. And that's from <laughs> Reverend Alison uh, Tomlin. <laughs> I think we'd like to be a fly on the wall of quite a number of these visits because, I mean, one of the things is happening, he, he, he is meeting both people that agree with him, but he's meeting a lot of people that disagree with him. And so I think yeah. that's it. Let, let, let's bring in some of the audience now. I mean, especially on, uh, yeah, there's, yes, this gentleman here, I'm in the front row, yeah. Um, especially uh, if we can have, you know, on, on this whole area of doctrine that we've been looking at just now. Well, I've been in Catholic evangelism for 55 years, and I found out during that time there are two things that mark the difference between Roman Catholicism and biblical Christianity. Now, the Catholic, while he will say he's justified by faith, there are always things he has to do starting with the dues of baptism, the dues of First Communion, the dues of their confirmation, and ending up where they're doing suffering in purgatory. The difference between that and the biblical plan of salvation, we believe in a work that was done. We don't believe there are things we have to do to be saved. We believe that Jesus Christ has finished the work on the cross of Calvary, and there's nothing, nothing, nothing as the hymn writer said, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Mm -hmm. And we believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And upon that rock, biblical Christianity will always stand. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any other comments on doctrine from, from the audience? Yeah, David, uh, yeah. Uh, this is uh, Ephesians <laughs> chapter 2, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Mm -hmm. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So All clearly right. here, it is faith first, faith in Christ, in Christ alone that justifies us. We then serve him. Yes. We serve him out of love and in gratitude for what he's done for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Are there are other? Okay, um, this is um, James 2 from verse 21. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you have there um, a very clear biblical statement which says that yes, we are justified by faith, but not by faith alone. Our works perfect our faith. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yep. Just in response to uh, our friend uh, quoting from James, in James chapter 1, he says, uh, by God's will are we begotten. In other words, it is the grace of God alone that saves. Yes. So please put... Uh, that passage in, uh, that you quoted in the context of the totality of Holy Scripture, Grace. which Roman Catholics, I'm afraid, never do. Grace alone, not faith alone. Grace okay. alone, not okay. faith alone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Grace alone, Grace not faith alone, alone is being said. Um, any others, uh, people that have got comment, would like to make on this whole area of, of doctrine at the moment? Yep. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that we are very often in, d in danger of turning the Bible into a kind of a law book, quoting bits of uh, one another, rather than looking at really what the totality of the message is. The totality of the message is that Jesus came to save us. And I cannot, as one who has made the journey to the Catholic Church, has spent 15 years on that journey, 
cannot see any... If I had seen anything in any of the Catholic teaching that made me think that that wasn't the central message of the Catholic Church, then no way would I be a part of it. Amen. But I am not... I can't sort of dip into all the different bits of the Bible to just reduce it to a kind of a law book. I, 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 I think that's a bit of an unhealthy way to go. But I do think that, of course, that the Bible is an inerrant source of oh, teaching uh, and uh, the Catholic Church accepts every single word in it. Mm -hmm. Amen. I, I, I must say, listening to the arguments tonight, I mean, both are saying the same thing. We're, we're, uh, but both sides are saying, we believe totally in Scripture, mm -hmm. and yet we're coming up with o opposite doctrines. Yeah. And, and so somewhere, somewhere no, along the line, no, uh, we, 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 we both can't be right. Then I think what is interesting, yeah. certainly what I encourage mm -hmm. folks at home, is what is right, because obviously both can't be right, what is right um, as, as, as we look at this. Let, let's move along a little bit further. Um, Patrick, uh, Pat, yeah, I think Patrick's got a question, um, so uh, we're, we'll take that now, Patrick. Thank you. Hello. Uh, the Catholic Church is most often uh, the church that's singled out uh, for most criticism by uh, militant atheists and uh, materialists uh, for its orthodoxy, uh, for its unwillingness to compromise on the gospel message. Don't you think that this is a very good sign that the Catholic Church is indeed the bride of Christ, um, as stated by uh, St. John, whom the world necessarily opposes? Okay. Um, Duncan, would you like to uh, begin to answer that for us, please? Um, no, uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, we've had a lengthy debate about it. I can't say much more about the gospel than I've already said. I mean, just referring to what the gentleman over there said, the use of the word justification in James... <clears throat> is definitely different from that in the other uh, uh, letters. It's, it's talking about evidence of a sincere faith. So the word is being used in that sense. Um, again, I judge, the, I judge the Church of Rome by the Bible. Now, again, another point um, uh, uh, that, that you were raising was, um, that Doug was raising, was we have the same scriptures. We don't have the same scriptures. The Roman Catholic canon is different to the Protestant canon. We have the New Testament and the uh, original uh, uh, Hebrew books. Um, Roman Catholicism has the intertestamental books, the Apocrypha, which are very interesting books for finding out about the period between the close of the Old Testament canon and the beginning of the New Testament. But there are certain doctrines, like the doctrine of purgatory, that do find some authority within Maccabees, for instance, and which I simply don't accept as inspired. So I return to the, the, the first point. I judge the Church of Rome by the teaching of uh, the Bible, the true inspired canon of Scripture, and, and, and it doesn't stack up. But I do also judge it historically. I do look at what the Church of Rome has done. And if you look at the history of the Church of Rome, I know every church has dark episodes, but the, epi the uh, history of the Church of Rome has some episodes of unparalleled darkness that do not stack up with the claims that it makes for itself. The Inquisition was simply inexcusable. Well, but how, how, many, how much time do we have? We could have several programmes and all the different issues we were brought up by that. Um, the Inquisition is interesting. I'll, be, I'll only spend a little bit of time there because I think your first questions were much more important. Uh, the Inquisition has been vastly... I mean, yes, it was. OK, look. Any, every single church, almost, apart from those who have had no, sort of no political power, any time when a church like the Anglican Communion or the, the Catholic Church or whoever has any, had any political power, I mean, we've been mixing those two things together in a theocratic sense, there has been abuse. And certainly the Inquisition was an abuse in certain cases. Actually, the Inquisition has been vastly exaggerated. Mm. Only very, 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 very few people died on the Inquisition in Spain, which is what you're referring to. Yeah. Very few people. Well, look at the well, historical evidence. I'm sorry. The black legend, oh. the black, well, the black yeah, the, legend of this the is ridiculous. The refuses to disclose but, the documents. One of the reasons Well, you don't why... need to. They're in Spain, actually, and you can look at them. You can see exactly how many people died. Well, there are a number of Inquisitions. Can I, can, can I, I one at a time, guys, can, if, I may, if I may, I'm not, I'm not going to spend that much time on this, because it's not that important. I think what's more important are your first things. Firstly, you talked about James. James, the letter of James, and you said that the use of justification there is justification before others. I think not. Abraham was not justified before others. He was not doing what he did and justified before others. No one saw what he did when he offered Isaac. No, Only God, God, saw, God saw him. Saw so he was justified before God, not before others. It has nothing to do with others. No, the second thing... No, no, the second, sorry. The, the, no, the I, think I want, to, sorry, I want to continue on on this, sorry. Like, you can come back hmm. on that if you okay. want. The other thing is the can of Scripture. The point, actually, of that is that um, the deuterocanonical text, which he's referring to, the seven deuterocanonical texts of the Old Testament, we do have in our canon, the uh, Protestants removed them in the, in the, uh, in the Reformation, 
But I think that raises a very important question, which is the problem that plagues Protestantism, which is Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura is, the, is what launched on the early, one of the earliest reformers called the Formal Principle of the Reformation. And the Formal Principle of the Reformation, because it proceeds from that principle, proceeds all the other points of the Reformation. In other words, it says that Scripture alone is the sole and fallible rule of faith because, from, because Scripture is sufficient to give you all the necessary and essential truths of the Gospel. The problem with that is there is a necessary oh, yeah. and essential truth of the Gospel you can't get from Scripture. It's called Scripture. The canon of scripture. You can't, there is nowhere in scripture where there is inspired content space. There's no golden index. You can't tell me Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, etc. from the Bible. You can't get it. You can't get that piece of information from the Bible. But you need that piece of information because without that piece of information, you don't know what scripture is. So you can't have your soul and foul rule of faith. So by definition, scripture is insufficient. What you need is a canon which has been received to us by tradition, which is to say it was handed on by the early Christian church to us today. Yeah. And the church itself recognized what tradition was right and wrong. The reason why the Deuterocanonical text and all the books you have at the back of your Bible, interesting, interestingly enough, Hebrews, James, all of those, the reason why you have those at the back of your Bible is because they were debated by the early church. They were called the anti-lugomena, the, the books that were debated or disagreed with. And the reason why we have this canon is because the Catholic church recognized, not decided, but recognized what was canonical and what was not canonical. You need scripture, you need tradition, you need the church. Scripture alone is utterly insufficient to give you all the truth that you need. We'll come to the audience in a moment. Duncan, I mean, you, you brought this up. Yeah. He's saying, yeah. I mean, yeah, why, uh, why, why can you take that position? I live or die by Sola Scriptura. The Bible alone is what I need. If I want to find out what is true about history, if I want to try and find out what's true about the future, if I want to find out what's true about the gospel, I get it from the Bible. And I don't accept them. Peter, it's interesting the way he argues, because he talks about the early church and says, the Catholic church. Mm. But if you look at the doctrines of the Church of Rome, these, these doctrines cannot be found in the church of the first and the second and the third centuries. So what was happening when the Protestant canon was established was the church was recognizing those books which were clearly inspired by God. And it's one or the other. Either what happened in the canon is a demonstration of the authority of the church over scripture, or, which is the Catholic position, or it is that the early church recognized those books which were inspired by God because they commended themselves to the believers at that time under the providential supervision of God. It is not a demonstration of the authority of the church over the Bible, still less it is, a, is it a demonstration of the authority of the Church of Rome, because the Church of Rome itself, as it now stands, is a complete aberration from the teaching of the early church. No, it's not. I'm sorry. If you look at the early church, you'll find all the teachings of the Catholic Church are actually found within, certainly baptism regeneration, certainly the Eucharist, and the fact that it's the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, certainly the canon, certainly the authority of the Bishop of Rome. We could go on. The simple fact of the matter well, is, the mass that, is not that you are rejecting books which disagree with your own doctrine. Okay, That's well, well, well uh, let's, uh, uh, when we sort of brought this whole area of the scriptures up, there was quite a lot of murmuring from, from the audience. Does anyone have turn that murmuring into uh, uh, some specific uh, arguments here at this point. Yeah, but maybe, is there anybody that hasn't spoken yet that wants to speak otherwise? Well, okay, well, okay, yes, uh, lady in the front row, uh, yes. Can I just say it has to be scripture alone. The Roman Catholic Church is scared of scripture. Oh, well, I, was right, one, yeah. I spoke to a young Roman Catholic and she said to me, my priest does not encourage me to read the Bible, oh. and um, he does not want me to read the Bible. And I just felt so, so terribly sad for her, because without the Holy Spirit and the Bible, you cannot go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other Sorry. comments? Uh, yeah, the gentleman there behind you. Uh, yes, I'd like to hear what Duncan would have to say. Uh, these books... Um, were removed by the Protestants. These books that are in the Catholic canon of the Bible, they were in the Bible. The Christians used them. Mm -hmm. The Christians accepted them. They were removed by the Reformation. So no, they, they were taken weren't. out. Well, they, they, weren't. they weren't in the early canons of Scripture. That's the whole point. They, they were. were introduced subsequently. No, they were in the, they were in the Jewish Scripture. The Jew, no, no, the Jews, the Jews, no, the Jews, no, they weren't. <laughs> the Jews no, removed. No, they were the, not. The, Jew, the Jews removed them yeah. because they didn't like them because the Christians used them. Yeah. 
No, no, that simply isn't the case. Uh, what, one of the things at the moment, without going into a complete programme where we go into all, all the, 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 we're going to have different arguments on that. One says it does, one says it doesn't. Go and look that up. Check that out yeah, for yourself yeah. because uh, it, it is a very key key issue. Of that, yeah. How did Jesus answer the devil? He used the scriptures. Yeah. It is written. Yeah. It is written. It is written. It's all we need. We don't need any of the mm. traditions. And we, we read in, in Mark 7 that uh, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees saying you make the word of God of none effect through your tradition. Gee, it's a thinking of men rather than the Holy Spirit and his inspired word. And 2 Thessalonians mm. 2.15 says maintain the traditions that were given unto you. You see, just simply saying those things. The church... Does not, yes, those traditions are the teaching scripture. that they taught, not what yeah, came centuries exactly. later there's by a, the Pope. There's a difference between false traditions, traditions of men, and apostolic traditions. And it's precisely the apostolic traditions that we recognise as authoritative. It's not tradition per se is wrong or bad, or scripture per se is wrong. No, it's about scripture and tradition. But can I just t talk to that lady there? If, that friend, if that's true, what your, what your friend has, then the priest was lying to them, because actually the Pope has said, the last Pope had said, you have to read your Bible. It is fundamentally important. And guess what? I've got a Bible right here. I read this Bible. I know many Catholics who love reading Scripture. I love this book, and that's precisely why I don't want to see it. Misused, abused, taken out of context by so many different thousands of Protestant denominations who all disagree with one another despite the fact they have the same authority, which is Scripture. How do you know what Scripture means? Well, you don't, because you don't have a central magisterial teaching authority, which is the Church guided by the Holy Spirit. It's not the church that, that made scripture. The scriptures were recognized by the church through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is really what's infallible. Not any man, not any group of people. It's the Holy Spirit, but it's, the question is, how does the Holy Spirit work? He works through his church, through the church he founded. So it's not about hating scripture or loving scripture. We all love scripture. What we want to see is a meaningful account of how we interpret it and how we know what it is. Okay. Uh, Duncan, we, we've got about mm. two minutes or so before we go to our yeah. break. Um, uh, Minute 30, actually. T two or three times um, mm. uh, Peter has said it's through his church, through his church, meaning the Catholic Church yeah. would obviously put you on the outside of it. Yes. Um, so what. Happily so. So uh, but, but how, how, would you, how would you answer that from that point of view? That, in other words, he's saying it's got to be the church, but it's not you. How, how, how do you answer that? The, the, they, they're saying I'm they're quite the happy to be outside the Church of yeah. Rome because I regard it as a false church for the reasons that I've just given. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the basic issue is belief in Jesus Christ. We've been through the debate, and I mean, Peter uh, is obviously an experienced debater, and he's put some interesting uh, 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 arguments out there. But you look at the essential teaching, say we revert to justification, that simple point, how am I saved? Mm -hmm. Is it true I'm saved by baptism? No, it is not. Is it true I'm by, saved by faith? Yes. Having read the whole of the canons and decrees of the Council in Trent at some effort in okay. the Council of Trent in the original Latin, it's quite clear to me that all of that teaching is utterly anti-scriptural. Right. So the true church is every true believer. We're going we're gonna to lose the folks that are watching the repeat right at that point. Oh. You've got to get back and watch it again soon. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again very, very soon. We're going to carry on, but see you later. Right, we're back in again, and uh, we uh, thank you. those of you that are still watching are here live, or you're watching the hour and a half repeat. Uh, we, we left it at an absolute climax at that point, and, and some of these issues, there are one or two more issues that I really want us to get onto uh, and to take up. But I think, I, I mean, I can see stacks and stacks of emails there, Rochelle. I, I think we should let our viewers have a, a little bit more of an opportunity at this point uh, to, uh, to share their thoughts. We have one here from Sandra, which says, why can't we just put aside secondary issues and unite under the banner of Apostles' Creed? If the Pope is going to address religious freedom and morals alone in this country, then I am happy. Um, because let's face it, the government is not listening to Christians in the UK. I, for one, admire the moral stance of the Catholic Church, who do not compromise on moral issues half as much as the Church of England does. As you know, uh, they even clo their, close their adoption agencies down because of their moral stance. I only hope that the Pope will speak out for us on these issues. That's one. Um, another one says, it's a sin of idolatry to worship a man no matter what office he holds. And that's from Phil. 
uh, there's another one that says, hi, I was delivered out of uh, being a Catholic in 1980 when I got born again and set free to worship God in spirit and in truth. That's from Chris. Um, I have another one here. It says, please read to our Catholic friends. It's Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophet. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God has set apart, uh, set forth to be a, a propitiation <laughs> through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that have passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he may be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Okay. Maybe a couple of more, Rochelle. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've just got one that says, um, I was once told I was going to hell by Catholics even though I accepted Jesus Christ because I didn't believe in the sacraments or I didn't receive the sacraments. That's from Anna. And I'll just read one more. It says, hello, Peter. Um, Jesus said many times about believing in him. We are to believe in him and his gospel. There is nothing, nothing we can do. It's all about believing in him. And it says thief on the cross with an exclamation yeah. mark. Yeah, we've, all, we've already <laughs> been um, there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's, that's the last one. Yeah, thing. well, I, I mean, obviously, uh, we're, we're trying to get back to you to, to read a few more be, 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 before we finish, uh, Rochelle. Uh, but obviously, folks are coming in on both sides here, which really does show the, the scope of, of, of those that are, are, are watching tonight. Um, we, we've had one question, but Andrew, Andrew Price, I think you have got uh, 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 a question for us as well. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, I'm very glad to hear you're not an atheist. Sadly, I, <laughs> so can't I. <laughs> sadly I can't accept you as a brother, especially as in another context you would have burnt me at the stake. No, I wouldn't. That actually, is the reality, okay. and, you, and your Jesuitical arguments can't, <laughs> can't deny that. But my question is this, concerning uh, the Romish doctrine of celibacy. Paul in Timothy expressly says that the forbidding of marriage is the doctrine of devils. In the light of the terrible scandals of sex abuse that hasn't just gone on in the last uh, few decades, it's been uh, rife in popery over the centuries, could you please uh, justify uh, the Romish position of priestly celibacy, bearing in mind that for, for the first thousand years of the history of the church, uh, it, it was not a dogma. No. Well, you'll be glad to know it's still not a dogma. It's in fact what's known as a discipline, which means that we practice it, but in fact we don't hold it to be a dogmatic truth that you must be celibate in order to be a priest. Uh, in fact, in Eastern Catholic churches we have married priests. And in fact, in Eastern Orthodox Church they have married priests as well. So this is not a dogma, it never has been. In the first thousand years what you mean is that it was never a discipline. Well actually, again it was. The celibacy goes back right back to the early church. It was actually affirmed after a thousand years because, guess what, a lot of priests had actually uh, well, put it put it this way. But no, well, that's just not an argument. That's just that's just okay. That's just an insult. But nonetheless, if you want me if you want me to answer the question properly, though, if you want me to, if you, would you like me to actually complete the argument, or would you like to speak let, yourself? Let, let, let Peter okay. speak. No, right, and, Andrew. I, Andrew, I will, I will let Peter let speak, and we'll come back to you after that. Yeah. Okay. Let's do two things. Firstly, let's do talk to the Bible, and then let's go to uh, the sexual abuse claim which he made. Right. This is 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 onwards. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the world, how to praise the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraints upon you, but to promote good order and secure your individual devotion to the Lord. What he's saying, if anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, his passions are strong, it has to be. Let me go down. Oh, hang on a sec. <laughs> Well, he's essentially, well, I've, I've actually lost it. But what he actually does say here is that I have you all be it as I am. In fact, Jesus also talks about those who are made eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. Celibacy itself is not a bad thing. And in fact, there's no ban of marriage either because you don't have to be a priest. If you're an, an, an unmarried and non, non-priestly man, you can choose to become a priest, in which case you do become celibate in the Latin rite of the church, which is, say, the, the rite that we exist in now, the Western rite. If you're an Eastern rite thing, it doesn't, doesn't really count. 
But if you are, a, you know, but you don't have to choose to become a priest. There's no ban of marriage in that sense, and it is a biblical principle. It was coming from the early church. Finally, I'll end up with the sexual abuse claim you made. The fact is, 75% of all sexual abuse happens within the family. That's a terrible, awful, awful thing. But the fact is that most fathers who sexually abuse, and most uh, wives who sexually abuse, it's mostly fathers, aren't celibate. Celibacy, there's no connection between celibacy and sex abuse at all. And in fact, even in, in the priesthood, the John Jay Report in America, which actually studied, it's an independent institute, and it studied the whole priestly sex abuse problem in America where they've had a particular problem. 5% of all the priests over a 52 year period, 1952 to 2002, were uh, accused of sexual abuse. Accused, not found guilty, just uh, accused. Under 1% of those were found guilty. So if it's really a celibacy problem, then why don't we see a greater proportion of priests doing it? The fact that the media has gone after this and has really reported on priests and priests and priests, regardless mm -hmm. of the fact that there are more teachers who are sexual abusers than there are priests, there are more sports instructors who are sexual abusers than there are priests, regardless of all of that. Well, um, well, yeah. Mistresses, there were, terrible, yeah. absolutely. Okay. They were, okay. it's terrible. Okay. Yeah. 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 Doesn't the first point, one, David's waving his hand over, we go to him in just a bit. Duncan, do, do, do you want to say anything on, on well, this? Well, yeah, I do. I mean, I think... Uh, I'm afraid to say I think it is a Jesuitical answer that is forbidding to marry. It's saying that anyone who wants to be a presbyter is forbidden to marry, and that is not a biblical requirement. It's quite clear that, that, that Peter, the, the uh, well, supposedly the first pope, I don't believe it, but the great apostle Peter, had a wife because he had a mother-in-law, and no sane man would have a mother-in-law unless he had a wife. <laughs> so, uh, and that <laughs> surely is church history, is it not, Peter? OK, so da David, David, you, hang on, you're, you're throwing your hands around here. What, what do you want to say? Yes, I I'm fascinated by this discussion, really. But what is the motion on the table? Absolutely. Let's get back to the mm. fact that the Pope is visiting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we need to do something about it. My own concern is that it is entrenching Catholics in a, a false religion and a false religious belief and a false church. Mm. Yes. But let's get back to the subject, which is the visit I, of the Pope. I, I would like to, and, and bringing in a number of the things that we're saying, one, one of the questions which, which we have here, which, which I want to bring in, and it brings a couple of things together um, with, with regard to this visit. Um, there, there's been a lot that's been said concerning sexual abuse and, and the acknowledging of the problem. There's been a lot of talk of whether the Pope will actually meet any of the, of, of, of the victims, etc. And, 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 and quite a lot was said by in a statement from the Vatican, but at the same time, in that same document, they actually went on to say that the attempted ordination of a woman to the priesthood was one of the most serious crimes of church law. And so, let me finish, I've started, so I'll finish. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so... What I'm talking about is, aren't these issues out of balance? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the fact that the ordination of women is seen as a terrible, terrible thing against church law, but it's almost, yes, we're sorry for what we did, but, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not as bad as this. Isn't this out of the day? And shouldn't the Pope, while he is here, publicly address both of these issues while he's here? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with the first question first. The actual document you're referring to, um, there were regulations that were brought out, there were new uh, uh, punishments for different things that were brought out. They weren't part of the same thing. Sexual abuse is a moral crime. The ordination of women is a crime against the sacraments. They are two separate de uh, subjects, right? They both have the same outcome. In other words, if you orda ordain a priestess, then that does lead to excommunication, absolutely, because we want to safeguard the sanctity of the sacraments. We believe that uh, ordaining priestesses uh, is not in keeping with the sanctity of the priesthood, and so we do have that punishment. That doesn't make it equal to the crime of sexual abuse or worse than the crime of sexual abuse. It put, it put it like this. I actually heard a lawyer put this argument, which I thought was very good. If um, a lawyer steals from a client, he's disbarred. If a lawyer uh, sexual abuses a client, he's disbarred. If he murders the client, he's also disbarred. But none of those doesn't make, the, just because the same punishment accrues to all those three crimes, it doesn't make them all equal in their moral gravity. They're fundamentally different things. Now, on to the sexual abuse uh, problem. The church uh, has dealt with this, and the Pope is dealing with this. In fact, he's been one of the leading reformers in the church dealing with this problem. He's had to deal with this for years and years and years, especially since 2001, when he, the, the uh, organization that he was part of, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, um, was actually put in charge of these crimes. It, he called it his Friday penance, having to look through these awful, awful crimes. Though, as I say, there weren't that many of them. People, it's been exaggerated grossly by the media, but nonetheless, they were terrible, awful things. I, as a Catholic, feel utter sorrow 
utter shame for this. And the church has expressed utter sorrow and shame. If your uncle, if you discovered that your uncle had been abusing one of your cousins and your aunt had in involved herself in covering it up, you would feel the same kind of shame and we feel that kind of shame. So what the church has done is, is it's deal, dealt with this issue and the Pope will be coming to this country and he wants to meet uh, people who have been sexually abused in order that he, just as he did in Malta, just as he did in America, just as he did in Australia, he did with Canadians who came to Rome as well. He met them and he's expressed his utter sorrow at this kind of thing. So yeah, he's, he is dealing with it, he has dealt with it. Whether or not he should deal with the issue of priestesses, I think he should probably stay away with that, from that thing because although we have, uh, the, everyone knows what the church, Catholic Church believes on priestesses, but uh, we also have to be very, very sensitive to the fact that not everyone agrees with us. Our Anglican brethren, not, I know not all our Anglican brethren, um, but uh, the Anglican official body doesn't agree on that uh, particular issue. And so I think it would be better for us to engage in that dialogue kind of on the quiet rather than on an official. I don't think that the Pope should harangue the Archbishop of Canterbury. That's a very interesting like. argument. I, um, <laughs> Duncan, what, yeah, what I won't do, I mean, the main thing is the cover-up. I mean, it is certainly true. I'm sure there is a link between uh, priestly celibacy and paedophilia. But the much more serious issue is the fact that people knew about these whoa, things. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, and that it was covered up. So this in, in Ireland, priests who uh, people knew that priests had been uh, abusing children. And instead of the priest being disciplined, he was transferred to a different diocese. And that does raise questions about the way this church operates. Uh, could, you equally we... could you name the name, sorry, if that? No, I can't. Oh, well, right. I have to, I'll, I'll find it out for you afterwards if you want me to, but I can't, I can't commit it to memory. <laughs> but, the, but, but a further thing that came, came to light also, but the, thanks, but the, the, a further thing that came to light was this IRA quartermaster. This was a man, Father Chesney, he was operating in South Armagh, he was act acting as a quartermaster for the IRA in, in the cloudy bombing in, 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 uh, in South Armagh. Uh, a number of people were killed, including an eight-year-old girl. Now, it was known to the Roman Catholic authorities that this man was involved in the murder of innocent women and children. That is not a trivial point, that is an extremely serious point. Now, the British government colluded in it, which is shame on them, uh, but even more shame on a church which makes big claims for itself and its own authority is that this man was not disciplined and was simply sent to Donegal where he can get up to the same stuff. So one hears, and, and I have to say, I mean, P Peter uh, is putting across the crace in, in a very amicable way, which is nice, but nonetheless, this doesn't sound to me like repentance. The Church of Rome covered these things up, and that is very serious. And here, I mean, I'm interested by this use of the phrase crimes in church law. There's an important point here. The Church of Rome conflates the role of the state and the role of the church. No, Properly speaking, right. there are not crimes in church law. Churches can discipline their own ministers. They can hold them accountable to their statement of faith. They can say that if a minister doesn't believe, and they should say, if their minister does not believe in the resurrection of Christ, that that minister should be dismissed. But if the minister commits a crime, if the minister commits child sex abuse, or if the minister colludes in murder, that is something which should come under the authority of the state and should be brought before the criminal Absolutely. courts. Therefore, Absolutely. there are no crimes in church law. Can I, can I answer all of these? Um, yes, please, yeah. Well, okay, just, just on the uh, sexual abuse case that you cited, can you at least tell me the country? Was it Germany, America? Ireland. It was Ireland, right, okay. Um, in canon law, right, can, let me put, make this case, okay. State law and canon law are two fundamentally mm. different things. Canon law deals is the internal law of the church. It's a bit like, for example, the internal procedures of any given organisation that you have. Okay? Every church has them, in fact. Uh, we have internal procedures that deal with the things within the church. They are not, the, the canon law is not supposed to be another version of criminal law. It doesn't punish people in sense of sending them to jail. It doesn't uh, you know, execute them or anything like that. There is no uh, equivalence here between state law and canon law, and they're not meant to be equivalent either. Canon law deals with whether or not, for example, a priest is, let's say a priest is, is, is guilty of sexual abuse, then it deals with whether or not we laicize him, which is to say whether we debar him from the priesthood, we throw him out of the priesthood. It doesn't deal with criminal things. The, the bishop, the, it is actually required in this country that if a bishop finds that a priest has been sexually abusive, then we report him to the authorities. We also do our own thing. We also say, right, we're going to now look at this and see whether or not we want to defrock you. And well, that, I think you we should. Well, in the past, you're right, there have been many mistakes. Father but the Chesney thing, in the IRA, that was known uh, Would you like me to bishop? answer that point? Okay. Father Chesney was known, and actually the reason he was sent to Donegal is because the British authorities and the Catholic Church agreed that if this was brought out, that in fact he had done this. And by the way, I utterly condemn the revolting 
crimes of that man. Um, I'm so thankful, by the way, I'm not a Catholic because I believe in Catholics. I'm not a Catholic because I believe in Catholics. I'm a Catholic because I believe in Catholicism, in Christianity, in Christ. I have not, nothing to do with the goodness of other Catholics uh, any more than you have the goodness of all Protestants because, after all, there have been many Protestant criminals as well. So, yeah, I totally condemn what Father Chesney did and I utterly condemn any cover-ups that have happened, but I think it should be pointed out that in that particular case, the reason why he was moved to Donegal is because they believed if it was brought forward that a priest had been actually a part of the IRA, it would cause further tension and more people would die. It was partly a political thing by the British government and the Catholic Church and not purely a, uh, a thing uh, done by the Catholic this Church. This was an utterly so, unprincipled decision taken by the Catholic yeah. Church and the British government, yeah, which was unjust. And if you're holding out that the Catholic Church has an authority which we go to above the scripture, surely this kind of behaviour shows one clearly that the Bible is the place to go to no. and not a church okay. which is clearly okay. corrupt. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let, let's, let's just, uh, we're, we're obviously uh, widening out, but in, in the light, especially what David brought us back to, of, of, of the fact that we're dealing with the Pope coming in with <laughs> these issues, w what do Pope folks feel? Do these things need to be dealt with? Should these things come out in the open and be talked about? Should there be debate at this point in time? Can he come and just ignore? all of this. What, what, what do folks feel, feel on this? Uh, yeah, the lady in the front row, yeah. Thanks. Hi, I actually want to ask um, Peter how he as a Catholic and the rest of the Catholics feel in bringing down the royal crown. Okay, can we, can we hang on to that? Yeah. We, we will take that question, but if we could just talk a little bit more about the Pope coming with some of these issues. Yeah, in, in the front row here. <laughs> Peter. May I ask the question, was the Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna laicized? Wait, what's his the name? The Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna, mm -hmm. who was up to his eyes in uh, repeated uh, paedophilia for decades. Uh, I don't know who you mean. Wait, can you name the person, please? Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't know who you mean. If he, wa if he wasn't laicized, he certainly bloody well should have been, pardon my language. Um, I cert sorry, I, uh, I, I feel very telling, angry about that. Are you telling thing. this audience you are unaware that the Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna was n not involved in... Yeah, well, I, I have named appa his appa office. Appa yeah, apparently, you're, you're not uh, entirely aware either. Can, can, but, can uh, we hold on a minute? But just well, I mean, all I can say is... Has, we, we've got to be careful here whether that was something that was said and, and, and hasn't been established. So I think at yeah. this point in time, we'd better move on uh, just in case okay. uh, from, 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 from that point of view. Um, yeah, sorry, this, this gentleman down here... But this, David's pointing down here, so is it... Yeah. I just want to bring the subject back to the debate about the Pope coming to Britain, and I want to support uh, Duncan on this, that I think it's a shame, ultimately, on the Queen as the head of the Protestant Church mm. for allowing this to take place. Mm. On her coronation oath, she said mm. she would uphold the Protestant faith. Mm. Now, she could stop the Pope from coming, but unfortunately, as you know, she's been made a vassal, so she's subject to the Pope, without going into the European Union scenario, but mm. ultimately mm. the Queen mm. should true. say no, because if we... I just want to ask Peter, actually, have you ever read a book by Alexander Hislop, The Two Babylons? Uh, I, because I that I does tell you exactly the origins of the Roman Catholic Church and its paganism. OK, let, sorry, we're, we're going to run out of time. Let, let's come back to this one issue, because it is an issue that we wanted yeah, okay. to talk about, this whole issue of it being uh, a state visit, of the fact that the Pope mm. will be entertained by the Queen, that the mm. Queen will... I mean, D Duncan, how do you feel about that, first of all? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's wrong. I, I agree with the gentleman there. Uh, uh, the Pope, the Queen, has taken a serious oath to maintain the Protestant Reformed religion established by law. Uh, and as I said, there's that wonderful part of the coronation service where she's handed the Bible. Um, the teaching of the Church of Rome is completely at odds with that. But more importantly, the Pope's own political claims, uh, they are claims over the Queen. As far as the Pope is concerned, the Queen is a heretic. Not only that, he doesn't admit her political status. So in that respect, I mean, it is a difficulty for Her Majesty because we have a constitutional monarchy. Uh, you know, the reality is that political decisions are taken by the government of the time. Gordon Brown took the decision, I think, for purely political purposes. I think it was a gesture, at least in part, directed at uh, potentially lost Labour voters in Scotland. 
and he wanted to ingratiate himself and the Labour Party with them. It didn't work, but I, I think that was part of the motive. So it is a difficulty for Her Majesty, but I certainly think, I will very much hope um, that he won't be invited to Buckingham Palace as a state guest, uh, and I sincerely hope that Her Majesty will not wear black. Uh, I, I think it's when she meets him in Holyrood House, because as you know, black is the sign of, of, of submission to the papacy, and indeed a mark of heresy. So uh, she should not accept what the Pope claims for her, and that means that she shouldn't accept him as a head of state. I mean, he's free to come to this country as Benedict, the head of this false religion, but not as a head of state. Mr. Ratchinger, mm. <coughs> <Mr. coughs> yeah. I mean, Billy, right. you, you obviously will take a, 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 mm. a different view to this. Um, Suffice to say, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, well, okay. I think that. Um, Upholding the Protestant Reformed religion is quite compatible with allowing the Pope as the head of state of the Holy See to come to this country. Uh, the claims of the Catholic Church do not contradict whether or not uh, we have um, the, the Queen. I certainly don't think, as a Catholic, that the Queen should be the uh, Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Fair enough, okay. But I don't think the uh, allowing of the, the uh, Pope to come here in any way uh, contradicts either of the principles of either of those two people. Uh, and fundamentally, this is a friendly visit uh, that, uh, you know, that, that, are, that the Queen is allowing to, not just allowing to happen, but embracing. I think that's a wonderful thing. She's visited the Pope actually in, uh, beforehand, and actually in, the, in some way, this is actually her returning the favour, which is entirely appropriate. Um, you can, worry about, you can, you can yeah. worry about whether or not this fundamentally contravenes Protestantism. I, I think that this goes beyond that. I think we unite on much more fundamental things. Uh, that, not that the disagreements aren't, aren't important, they are, but we unite on so many fundamental things this, is, this doesn't become a problem for me. I shouldn't, it shouldn't do for you. Well, oh, hang on. We're coming. Yeah, let's go. But also the... That mic doesn't no. sound to be on to me. Is the but also the okay. Settlements Act of 1700, yeah. which states that a sitting monarch cannot mix with the Pope. Not mix? She, yeah. Uh, it says no, it so. says she can't. It says the, car, the, the sitting monarch cannot marry a, a no, Catholic. No, it's not just marry. Uh, I've got yeah. a letter here and from the Catholic. Ministry of Justice that admitted that it applies to the Queen. An already crowned monarch. I think you mean in England, possibly, no, uh, in and I Britain. think that's what they're meaning in Scotland. She's, she, possibly, that's I why don't. I asked you. I said, I how do know. you feel as a Catholic and the rest of the Catholics feel for bringing down the crown? Because the penalty, according to the Settlements Act, is that she loses regal power. She, she you know, she cannot reign. Well, you know what? I haven't read all the Settlement Acts, so I can't, so I can't verify whether or not you're, what you're saying is right or wrong. I doubt it. But I will do. <laughs> um, but whatever. That's news to me, to be honest. I, I, I yeah. thought I did know, but I, yeah, if you if you if you've got it, let, let's right. take John. Okay. If, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a Christian now, thank God, by the mm. grace of God. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't I wasn't brought up a Catholic. I was beat up a Catholic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And isn't there enough false religion in this country? It's causing trouble without having any more here. I mean, that, that, that's rather you, you sit question, there, then. you sit there nodding your head at what people's got to say. You haven't got a clue. And I well, bless you in Jesus' name. I bless you too in Jesus' name. Uh, but you haven't the, got the authority to do that, sir. Uh, I do, actually. No, you don't. On the authority of my baptism, Bible, on the authority right? of Jesus Christ, yes. I bless you. And whether you like it or not. Uh, but nonetheless, and, and well, seriously bless you, but nonetheless, I think that is a loaded question. I, think, I don't think we should get uh, at all involved in mu uh, mutual vituperation. I think it's, it's actually quite good to have a nice, mutual calm blessing. debate. Uh, and I think mutual blessing is quite the way I shall leave that question because it's, it's not worth getting into anything else. Okay, okay well, um, have, we, have we got a little bit... Yes. I, hang on a minute, yeah. <laughs> We've dealt with that. I'm not going to go Do, we, do we have just a short quote from that letter? Because it looks yeah, like about 75 it. pages long there to me. <laughs> No, I mean, here's the letter that I got because I've been sort of like, you know, going backwards and forwards with the Ministry of Justice, Constitutional Department. All right. And they said that uh, um, it only applies for the Queen. This is, they're not disputing what the actual act says. The actual act says that the, the Crown Monarch must not mix with the Pope or all things pap Papist. Yeah, in this letter, they're disputing that uh, she, she's mixing with them by allowing him to come. They're now saying that if it's, it, it's only applicable if she has Holy commun Communion um, at uh, a Catholic church. And she yeah, had she's Vespers. She's certainly not allowed to do that on Yeah, the she had Vespers moment. in 2005. But she didn't receive Mass, did she? It's, communion. it's, communion. it's, it's, it's communion. not just communion, it's mixing and being reconciled. I've got mm. a, a, a snippet out of the Act. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, we we haven't got it. time to read all those but pages, getting back but to, I'm getting, sure... Getting back to Peter, bro, this is, this is giving a bad, uh, a bad uh, witness to the Catholic Church because you're breaking the law of the land by coming to a country, causing a lady that's been a, a monarch for the past 60 years to lose her crown. <laughs> OK, uh, that's an interesting point. Okay. Um, let, let, let's take a few more emails before we run out of time here. Uh, if, if we can, please, Rochelle. Okay. okay, I've got one from Steve that says, uh, Hi, for the past 1900 years, Christians have been opposed to the Roman Catholic Church and they have recognized that she was the mystery Babylon talked about in Revelation. Yet during the past few decades, evangelicals and other denominations have tried to unite with her. Hasn't the Roman Catholic Church sought to bring all Christians back under the authority of the Pope since the turn of the 20th century? Rochelle, I, I've just heard we've only got three minutes left. I want to give our two guests opportunity for a minute each to sum up. Um, uh, we, we, we started with you, Duncan, we'll start with you to sum yeah, up what you. would you like to leave with us? Yeah, so someone said wisely uh, when we were assessing, because the gentleman was there talking about the Pope, is it a blessing for the Pope to make a papal visit to this country? And I said no, and I still say no, uh, because the Church of Rome pre teaches a false gospel. But one thing I, I, I do want to say, someone wisely said, the Church of Rome, when it is in power, is a lion. When it is weak, it is a lamb. But when it's in between, it's a fox. And I have to say, though Peter is a pleasant chap, I think we've seen something of that tonight. Roman Catholic argumentation uh, can be complicated and disingenuous and also can refuse to deal with real issues of scriptural disobedience and real issues which ought to cause shame to the Church of Rome. And I think it is, uh, I'd simply say again, we are to judge the Pope we're to judge the Church of Rome by the Bible, and the best thing for this country would be return to return to the Bible and to the Gospel, and to say no to the false teaching of the Church of Rome and no to the Pope. Okay, thank you, Duncan. <laughs> About a minute for, for you, Peter. What would you like to leave with us? I'll, I'll do it very very quickly. Preface it just by saying the, the celibacy thing. If you want to go to 1 Corinthians 7, 25 to 29, I don't have the time to quote it, but that was what I was talking about. I went too far. Sorry. Anywho. Um, Look, the Pope is coming here, invited by the government of this country, to talk to the, the people of Britain about important issues that, that affect us all. And the things that we can actually all as Christians unite on. A gospel of life, social justice, the meaning of life, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know we disagree on many of the parts of that, and I'm not saying they're unimportant. I think they are very important. The gospel, justification by faith alone, is a very important issue. But nonetheless, I think that what I hope that all Christians this visit will bring is an opportunity to dialogue with one another in respect and in love. And uh, as Isaiah 118 says, come, let us reason together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. I I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Peter, for putting it. A little bit hairy at times, but you both, I think, put your case. What we really want you guys to do is to go away, to consider, to think, certainly to pray that God may really uh, minister to each one of our hearts the truth as it is in Scripture and, and, and whatever that be. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for watching us at home. We really do appreciate all that you've done for us. Thank you all very much indeed. See you again very soon. We, we will really want to take these things, minister to, to each other in love, share to fellowship together. Please do that as we go out, just minister to one another. Thank you very much indeed and bye for now. Bless you all. <laughs> <laughs>